All right, we're continuing in this series we've been in for the last few weeks entitled The Finish Line. And if you're just now joining us, you can go to our website, weareimpact.com, or just download our app, and right there in the app, you can go back and watch the messages that have been a part of this series so far. But what we've been telling you, or remind you, is that we are nearing the end of the end, and God has left some breadcrumbs for us to recognize. We're getting close to the finish line. You know, if you're in any kind of a race, and as you get close to the finish line, folks are cheering you on as you get close, and they have some markers that in case you're starting to get weary, they want to encourage you and make sure you know you don't have that much longer to go. And God has left some breadcrumbs for us. And it's kind of similar to what happened in the Old Testament where there were a number of prophecies throughout the Old Testament that pointed to the Messiah coming. In fact, if you look at the life of Jesus Christ, Jesus fulfilled over 300 prophecies from the Old Testament that talked about his birth, talked about how he would live, talked about how he would die, talked about him being raised from the dead, even spoke of the things he would say when he was on the cross. He said, well, why did God go through the process of doing all that? So that when we recognize what he, where he was born, how he lived, what he said, how he died, how he was raised from the dead, we wouldn't miss him. It's intended to tell you what to look for so that when he showed up, we wouldn't end up missing him. Well, guess what? God has given us some breadcrumbs. He's given us some signs today that tell us that we are getting close to the end so that we will not miss the fact that we're right here at the end getting ready to wrap up. Can I tell you one of the big signs that God has given us that sometimes we miss is the crazy weather events that are happening? Crazy weather events. Has anybody just noticed that we've had some crazy weather events? I mean, at the same time, on one side of the country, you can have out in California, they got wildfires where, you know, they, they can have wildfires because they haven't had any rain. And then another part of the exact same country, there's got too much rain and it's flooding. And, I mean, we just this past, you know, uh, uh, last week, week before last, I told you had an earthquake in New York City. Uh, we, we've, the last few years, that they've said that the hurricanes are getting stronger and stronger that are coming through. Thank God they haven't affected us because we pray those hurricanes away. We declare protection over our city, but what I'm trying to get you to see is that we're seeing more and more weather events. I saw this past week. I don't know if you noticed it. There was flooding in Dubai, in the desert, <laughs> in the desert. I, I saw airplanes trying to take off from the tarmac that were, were, were pushing through water that was up to the, t- to, the, to the sides of the airplane. What I understood is they got more rain in one day than they normally get in a whole year. Let me tell you what I believe is happening so you understand that when you see these strange weather events, when you see over in Europe, they got golf ball size or or tennis ball size hail falling from the sky. It's because of what the Bible says here in Romans chapter 8, verse 19. It says, for all of creation is waiting eagerly for that future day when God will reveal who his children really are. Because against its will, all of creation, talking about the earth, was subjected to God's curse. But with eager hope, the creation looks forward to the day when it will join God's children in glorious freedom from death and decay. For we know right now that all of creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to this present time. So what do we understand about all this crazy weather? The earth was cursed because of Adam's sin. I mean, the trees didn't do anything wrong. (laughs) The flowers didn't do anything wrong. Adam's sin caused a curse to fall upon the earth, but the whole earth, the Bible says, waiting for that day when the last Adam, Jesus Christ, will show up and he will rule the earth and care for the earth the way the Bible teaches that it should be. And until then, the Bible says the whole earth is groaning in travail, groaning like a woman who's in childbirth. And I believe that's the reason why you see all these crazy weather events. I know we can, we can attribute it to global warming and to the, to, the, to, to the carbon footprint, but at the end of the day, the earth recognizes we're getting close to the end. In fact, I, I, was, I was thinking through something this week, and then I saw a video about it, that from the time of Adam to Abraham, it was 2,000 years. From the time of Abraham to Jesus, it was 2,000 years. <laughs> From the time of Jesus' death, which, which, which most, most religious archaeologists date that somewhere around 33 A.D. when he was crucified, somewhere in that neighborhood, 30 to 33 A.D. From that time till now, we're, we're at 2024, you're talking about 2,000 years. So from Adam till now, you're talking about 6,000 years. 
There's going to come a time where there'll be a trumpet sound. We'll all get raptured out of here. And for seven years, there'll be total chaos in the earth. After that seven-year period, watch, this will blow your mind. After that seven-year period, there'll be 1,000 years when Jesus rules and reigns. There won't be a president that you got to report to. Come on, there won't be governors that are unrighteous. There won't be mayors that you got to question their integrity. Jesus will rule and reign for 1,000 years. We could say it'll be 1,000 years of thank God rest. Watch this, watch this. So for 6,000, a day with the Lord is as 1,000 years, and 1,000 years is as a day. So for 6,000 years, there's been activity, there's been pain, and then for 1,000 years, there'll be total rest. Could that be equated to six years of creation and one day of rest? What is God trying to say? He's always leaving some breadcrumbs to let you know that we are getting closer to the end than you can imagine. And if you're born again, you ought not be terrified by that fact. You ought to be shouting right about now. I said you ought to be shouting right about now. Come on, you ought to be excited right about now because the end of the end of the end is getting closer than we ever imagined. Now, among the signs of the last days, we told you, Paul, writing a letter to a young pastor by the name of Timothy, gave us 19 characteristics, or we could say 19 signs, that will be prevalent in the days just before the return of Jesus. These aren't, these aren't well, this is going to happen in Russia, and this is going to happen in Ukraine, and this is going to, no, but he's given us signs. He's given us the atmosphere to look for. And the closer we get to, get to the end, he's telling us that these are the traits that you can expect to see around you. Now, let me tell you this. These should not be the character traits of God's people. He's describing what it's going to be like in the world, but how many know we operate in the fruit of the Spirit? Thank you for the 12 of you that operate in the fruit of the Spirit with me. I said, how many know we operate in the fruit of the Spirit? Let me say it again. How many know we operate in the fruit of the Spirit? And it's important to to help you understand that because I'm describing what it's like in the end for the world. But for us as believers, God has called us to be salt and light. So everything I'm describing as these character traits of the end, we should be pursuing to be countercultural. We should be pursuing to be the exact opposite. Everything the Bible says the world will be doing in these last days, we should fight hard to make sure I'm not a part of that. Amen. Look at 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1 again. But know this. In other words, this is mandatory information. In the last days. Everybody say last days. days. Come on, everybody say last days. days. We're not just talking about toward the end. We're talking about the very last of the last days, the last little sliver of days. There's going to be perilous times, times that are hard to hear, hard to deal with, hard to bear, hard to stomach what you're hearing on the news. For men will be lovers of themselves. We told you last week that means there's going to be a selfish spirit in the air. Come on, we got to work hard to not be a part of that selfish spirit that's in the air. I don't know about you, all week long, I had the Holy Spirit just, just checking my heart. Don't let yourself drift towards selfishness because the closer we get to the end, there's going to be a selfish spirit that hovers, and we got to work hard to make sure we're not a part of that spirit. In these last days, men will be lovers of their money. Then it says boasters. Everybody shout boasters. boasters. Come on, everybody shout boasters. boasters. Then it says proud. Everybody shout proud. Then it says, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanderers, without any self-control, brutal, despisers of those that are good, traitors, headstrong. Then it says, haughty. Everybody shout haughty. Haughty. Come on, say it again. Shout haughty. haughty. Then it says, lovers of pleasure rather than or more than lovers of God. Then the last one says, having a form of godliness, but denying its power. 19 different characteristic traits that the Bible says you can expect to see the closer we get to the last day, the closer we get to that trumpet sound, this is what it's going to be like. Now, of those, of those 19, watch this, three of those go hand in hand. I had, you to, I had you to repeat those, boasters, proud, and haughty. The last day is going to be filled with people who are boasters, who are filled up with pride, and who are haughty. I kind of summed those up into these these three words right here. The last day is going to be filled with people that have the big head. (laughs) Tell your neighbor, don't have the big head. head. Come on, tell the one on the other side, don't you get the big head. (laughs) We're going to have to all fight. I'm, I'm having fun with this, but the truth of the matter is, in these last days, we're going to have to fight to make sure we don't end up being people that have the big head. 
Because the Bible says it's going to be a climate. And just like a current in a river or a, 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 an ocean that's heading out to the ocean, it is easy to get sucked up in the current and get pulled somewhere you weren't even trying to go. I remember being out on, my, on, on boat fishing. You know, I go fishing a lot. And most times I'm going with somebody else. A couple times, you know, not a couple times, lots of times I go by myself. I remember one time I was down in St. Augustine fishing and, and uh, I, I'm, I'm anchored up and you know, I'm out here fishing, having a good time, and I'm on a, you know, when you fish, you don't supposed to be in the channel. That's like the highway. You don't want to be in the middle of the road. And so I'm on this one side of the channel, and I'm fishing, and I'm just having a good old time fishing and enjoying myself, and I look up, and I'm on the other side of the channel, which means I've drifted all the way through traffic. <laughs> Could have gotten ran smooth over. And it wasn't, it wasn't because the engine was on. It's because the current. Come on, somebody. The, I, wasn't try, I wasn't trying to go to the other side. I was content. I thought I was anchored. Come on, man. I thought I was anchored. If you had asked me, are you anchored? I would have told you, I'm anchored in the Lord. But I wasn't as anchored as I thought. And because the current was moving, I looked up and I ended up on the wrong side, the other side of the river. What am I saying? The current of this world is pulling so strong. If we don't make sure we're anchored in the Lord, come on, talk to me, somebody. If we don't make sure that we stay anchored, that we, that we spend enough time with God, that we allow God's his standard to be on the inside of us instead of the world's standard. If we, don't, if we don't make sure that we end up listening to what God has to say instead of all the gossip that's on social media, we can end up on the wrong side because we let the current of this world take us somewhere we didn't intend to go. The Bible says in the last days there will be boasters. Boasters. What does that mean, Pastor? The last days are going to be marked by a culture, listen to this, that has no humility or gracefulness. Instead, the last days will be filled with those who boast and brag and purport themselves to be better than everybody else, either through their words, through their actions, or just through their demeanor. Now, I love sports, and if you're a sports lover, and you've been watching sports for a while, it is, I start thinking about this. It's easy to look up now and realize that when you start looking at the actions of athletes and sports fans today, we've gone a long way from back in the day. I mean, there's, there's always, and nothing wrong with some healthy, you know, uh, talking trash, and, but we got to the place now where, where every little thing that happens, folks are boasting about it. You can have a team down by 40 points, and somebody dunks on somebody, they come down talking about how little they are. They're not that little. They're up on four, by 40 points on you. But every little action that takes place today, not only among the athletes, but even fans in the stands who aren't doing a doggone thing, but will get into fights on social media, bragging about their team, boasting about what their player can do, and find themselves with, with parents in the stands, getting into fights with officials, having situations that never should happen. Why? Because we have a society today that has zero humility, but instead there's a lot of boasting and bragging about who I am and what I can do. I'm preaching better than you saying amen. amen. The word boasters come from a Greek word, alazon, A-L-A-Z-O-N, alazon. Listen to this. The word alazon means an empty pretender, a braggart, or a boaster. And where does the word come from? It comes from a stock character in Greek drama. The Alazon is a stupid braggart who is easily tricked and defeated by the clever underdog known as the Iron, E-I-R-O-N, which is where we get our English word irony from. They're defeated by the Iron who allows the Alazon to brag about his accomplishments while all the while downplaying his own ability. Listen to this from the free online commentary. A man who is guilty of this sin of Alazon boasts about trade deals with, which exist only in his imagination. He boasts about connections with influential people that really do not exist. He brags about gifts to charities and public services which he never gave or rendered. He says about the house that he lives in is really too small for him and he's got to buy a bigger one. Plato described this as the person who claimed greatness that he did not possess. A boaster is the man who seeks to attract admiration by claiming advantages he does not really possess or certainly does not possess them to the degree that they're putting forth. Listen to this. Therefore, to a degree, 
Every boast is really a lie. The braggart lives his life for the purpose of impressing the world around him. I need a better amen in here today. See, every one of us, it's human nature. We all, we, we all it's human nature. There's nothing bad with it about this. We have a natural tendency to accentuate our better qualities and downplay our weaknesses. I mean, whenever they ask me to fill out one of those surveys to describe your strengths and your weaknesses, it's a lot easier for me to write down my strengths than it is my weaknesses. Maybe I got blind spots and I don't see my weaknesses well, or, or maybe it's just more painful to have to acknowledge my weaknesses. I think it's all of our natural tendencies that we, we, we want to accentuate our, our positives and, and downplay our negatives. I mean, when you look at all of our social media, you see the highlights. I mean, that's not your whole life right there. We, we, we don't put all the bad stuff. Or we, we shouldn't be putting all the bad stuff out there. We tend to accentuate the, the, the positives and kind of downplay the negatives. That's natural. The boaster, however, becomes intoxicated with the applause of the crowd and continually looks for new ways to gain the favor or approval of those that they are trying to impress. Can I just say this? Social media has, has become a breeding ground for Alazon behavior. It's the perfect storm. It's the breeding ground for Alazon behavior. Behind a username and a profile picture, people can become whoever they choose to be. Hmm? Give them a username and a profile, but you don't know who that really is. Hmm? Oh, that's how folks have gotten catfished and end up in an in a online relationship with somebody. And man, you look up and come to find out you've been talking to them for three months. You find yourself in love and... Then you finally meet, they don't look nothing like what they told you. <laughs> Got two teeth and they're in the back of their mouth. And... <laughs> so I was thinking about it. If you're in an online dating relationship, you need to ask for a proof of life picture. <laughs> in fact, with, with, with AI now, don't even ask for a picture. Ask for a proof of life video. Tell so I want you to record a video of yourself with, with today's news in the background. I need to make sure this is really you. Come on, somebody. Because <laughs> behind a profile picture and a username, people can become whoever they want to be and can boast and brag and talk about who they are, what they've done, what they've accomplished. And social media, unfortunately, will many times just eat it alive. See, Christ-like, understand this. Proverbs 27, 2 says this, let somebody else praise you. Come on, this is in the Bible, folks. God's got a, 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 a counter for everything that's going to happen in these last days. He says to believers, those that are in Christ, those that follow God, let somebody else praise you, not your own mouth. Let an outsider talk about how amazing you are and not your own lips. Come on, that's right in the same Bible that has God supplying all of our need and Jesus being our healer. He says, stop boasting and bragging about who you are, what you've done, what you've accomplished. Let somebody else do that. Just do the work. Let everybody else tell the story. Amen. Let somebody else praise you, not your own mouth. Let an outsider do it and not your own lips. See, Christ-like character includes letting other people speak of your virtues instead of declaring it ourselves. Again, social media has become a breeding ground for this kind of behavior. We see folks posting pictures, and they post a picture, and I know I look fine. <laughs> well, are you asking us or telling us? Because you're inviting some commentary at the moment. Post your picture. You ain't got to say how beautiful you look. Folks will come on and, and compliment you. Folks will come, especially ladies. You know how ladies are. Girl, you're looking good. Girl, you better work that thing. See, ladies can get away with that. I wish some dude would show up on my picture. Ooh, BD. <laughs> Blocked, <laughs> reported. <laughs> Security. <laughs> Listen to this. Boasting is evil. Listen to this. Listen to this. Boasting is evil. And we've got a purpose, listen to this, to eliminate it from our hearts, not just our words. So the reason it shows up in our words is because in our hearts. 
The reason it shows up when we type is because it's in our hearts, because out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Out of the abundance of the heart, the fingers type. We got to work to eliminate boasting from our hearts, not just our words. Listen to this quote I came up with. The root of boasting is pride, competition, and a low self-worth. Listen to this. We should seek to be our best, not the best. I'm not on a mission to be the best pastor. I'm not. I'm not on a mission to have the best church. I want a mission to be the healthiest and best we can be. I want to be my best. See, because when I, when I get to heaven, God's not going to stand me up next to my friend Tim Stair and compare uh, Impact Church and Elevation Church, Elevate Church. He's not going to stand me up next to, 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 to any of my other you know, pastor friends uh, and, and compare our church to what their church did. When I get to heaven, I'm standing in a single file line. And I'm stepping up to the, the podium to, to hear from God all by myself. It's not even April in me. It's me by myself to give an account, come on, for what God tried to do through me. Which means I'm not in a race against Rudy McKissick at Bethel. I'm not in a race against any of my other friends, Gary Williams. I'm not in a race against these other guys. You know why? Because the only person I'm in a race against is me. I'm trying to look over to see, am I where I should be based on what God told me to do? And as long as I do what God told me to do, there will come a day when I will hear him say, well done, you good and faithful servant. And he's not going to say, well done, compared to anybody else. We got to get into, we got to get into the mode. Doesn't matter how I stack up against you. What matters is how I stack up against me. Let me work hard to be my best. Let me, let me work hard to give God the best I have to offer. That's why, that's why I don't ever try to preach like anybody else, man. I'm not. I thank God all the gifts of the body of Christ. Everybody can't teach the way I teach. Everybody can't preach the way somebody else preaches. I wish I could preach like Rudolph McKissick Jr., but he'd be tearing it up. I'll be watching some of his videos. My, 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 my voice gets hoarse when I'm just listening to him. I got to drink some tea after listening to him preach. But he's tearing it up. Wow, that's the gift God put on his life. See, the reason, the reason why people tend to drift over into boasting is I'm trying to make you feel good about me. Let me tell you, the reason why we do that because I don't feel good about myself. And if I boast and brag, I think if I can make you feel better about me, if I can blow myself up in your eyes and somehow or another it brings me up to that place. Actually, what it does is put more pressure on you to live up to something you're not actually walking in in real life. I like what Peter and John said when they came to the gate. Beautiful, there's a man there saying, give me some money. And Peter said, silver and gold I don't have, but what I have, I'll give it to you. In other words, I can't give you something I don't have. All, all I have is what I got almost every Sunday. That's it. If, if you don't like my preaching and teaching, I'm sorry. I don't have anything else. I can't tap dance. <laughs> huh? I don't, have any, I don't have another trick up my sleeve. So I show it with the armor God has given me. And I give it with all the humility I have in my heart. And whatever God is able to do with that, to God be all the glory. Come on, somebody. Come on, man. Come on. There's some of you that know you're supposed to be up, on the, up here on this stage singing with this worship team. And you've allowed yourself to get psyched out because in your mind you don't think you're as good as somebody else. It's not a comparison. Bring God what you have to offer. You'd be amazed at what he can work with from a a heart full of humility. See, uh, to, be, to be honest, I can't stand somebody that's got a bunch of talent and they, all they want you to do is see their own talent. Talent and anointing don't necessarily go together all the time. They can go together, don't get me wrong. But just because somebody's talented doesn't mean that there's any oil on what they're doing. I'd rather have somebody that sings okay but are dripping in the anointing of God. Because it's the anointing of God that removes burdens and destroys jokes. Somebody ought to shout amen in this place. Listen to what the Bible says in Jeremiah chapter 9, verse 23. This is God's message. He says, don't let the wise person brag because of their wisdom. Don't let the heroes brag because of their exploits. Don't let the rich guy brag because of their riches. If you're going to brag, brag about this and this only. What is it, God? That you understand and you know me. <laughs> in other words, if you're going to brag about anything, say, I was smart enough to surrender my life to Jesus Christ. I'm God, and I act in loyal love. I do what's right and set things right and fair. 
and I delight in those who do the same things. These, he said, are my trademarks. He said, if you're going to brag in anything, brag about the fact that I know God. I've surrendered my life to him. I once was lost, but now I'm found. That's the only thing that we have that's worth bragging about. How about Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8? I love this. It says, God saved you by his what? I can't hear you. God saved you by his what? Come on, say it with your chest. God saved you by his what? By his grace when you believed. And you can't take credit for it. It is a gift from God. Salvation is not a reward for how much money you've given. It's not a reward for how many times you've come to church. It's not a reward for how faithful you've been in serving. It's not a reward for any of the good things we have done. Watch this, so that none of us can boast about it. What is God trying to say? He's trying to say everything good about us is a result of the grace of God, which is why right about now you ought to be thanking and praising God that he's been so full of grace toward us. Come on, that he's given us what we did not deserve, and he kept from us stuff that we should have deserved. We don't need to be famous. Come on, somebody. We don't need to be well known. Come on, somebody. We don't even have to be well thought of by other people as long as we live our lives to extend the fame of Jesus Christ. That's all that matters. I I just want to make him more famous. I'm not making him famous because he's already famous. I want to extend his fame. I don't want folks to know about George Davis and and how great he was at this or that. I want to extend the fame of Jesus Christ. I want to be known as somebody who did nothing more than exalt the name that is above every other name, the name of Jesus. Here's a quote from a, a, a dear preacher of the gospel named John the Baptist. This is what he said. He said, he, talking about Jesus, must increase, but I've got to decrease. How I many you know that's our job? <laughs> Jesus should be increasing to the world. Well, our fame and our notoriety should be decreasing. I'm, I'm noticing something, and I'm not picking on anybody else. I'm noticing something in Christianity. We, we got a whole lot of celebrity Christianity happening. I'm telling you what the devil does. The devil is the master of set you up so he can rip the rug off from under you. I work hard to not let myself be known as some celebrity guy. I don't, I don't want to be put on a pedestal. I know how human I am. I know how jacked up I can be at times. I don't want anybody thinking how great I am. I want them knowing how great Jesus is. And I think we have to watch it here in Christianity that we don't allow ourselves to secretly start wanting to be what the world is. And allow ourselves to become celebrity-like the way the world does. And gain fans the way the world does. Because the enemy, when he sees that, you become the prime target for him to put you on display and then rip the rug right from under you. He said boasters in the last days. Then he said there's going to be a lot of pride or proud in the last days. What does the word proud, proud or pride mean? It's an exaggerated opinion of one's self-worth. An exaggerated opinion of one's self-worth. You can see how these tie in together. Don't get me wrong. We should have a high opinion of ourselves. The Bible says we ought, we ought not think more highly of ourselves than we ought to. But the, the assumption is you should have a high opinion of yourself. Do not walk around thinking low of yourself. Don't let anybody else think low of you. <laughs> somebody, some, somebody else is going to think low of you. It's time to separate yourself from their company. Because God doesn't look at you as some lowly person. So no matter how much money or prestige or title somebody has, don't let them look down on you. I ta- I've taught my sons and my daughter, when somebody's shaking your hand, you shake their hand, look them right in their eyes. No matter who they are. Because at the end of the day, we all got to put our pants legs on one, one leg at a time. But pride is to have an exaggerated opinion of one's self-worth. Haughtiness, on the other hand, is to function with an arrogant demeanor that looks down on other people. You see how all three of these tie in together. Haughty is to, to function with an arrogant demeanor that looks down on other people. So when you put pride and haughtiness together, this is what it is. Pride is the, out, is the inward feeling. That's the part you can't see. Pride is the inward feeling. I, I, just like high blood pressure. I can't look out here and tell who's, who's got high blood pressure. We all look the same. Pride is that inward feeling. Watch this. But haughtiness is that outward look. Haughtiness is a little joke that we tell or the snicker we have or the little attitude we have about somebody else. See, haughtiness is, is, is elbowing your friend because the kid at school has got on some old gym shoes. And you think that's funny. Don't know their story at all. Don't know what they had to go through just to make it to school. 
and instead of having Christ-like behavior to maybe befriend that kid and help make life a little easier, haughtiness looks down on them because you got the new Jordans on that you didn't buy. You don't have any money either. Your, your parents got money. It's not yours. Haughtiness will look down on that person. Ha- haughtiness will, 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 will see some kid with a, a, a disability or speech impediment or learning disability and and instead of having Christ-like character and embracing them, maybe trying to make life easier for them, haughtiness looks down on them because they don't speak as well as you do. They stutter a little bit or they have something else going on. And, and we can turn it into a joke. And there's a lot of things that, that people joke about today that really aren't funny. You can learn a lot about Christian character based on what we laugh at or what we think is funny. See, haughtiness is the person that goes to work, and if they're running into one of the execs, they, 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 they're all cheerful with them. But to barely speak to the receptionist or barely speak to the facilities person and walk right past them, don't know their name, but you, you, you know what color car the, the execs drive and where they park. and Why? Because haughtiness gets caught up in trying to fit in with a certain group of people instead of realizing, come on, talk to me, somebody. Instead of realizing, come on, God loves everybody just the same. God, God doesn't love you more based on how much money you make or where your house happens to be. Come on, you still with me? Yeah. See, the Bible's got a whole lot to say about this thing called pride. Proverbs 8, 13, it says, The fear of the Lord is to hate evil, pride and arrogance, and the evil way and the perverse mouth. God says, I hate it. Proverbs eleven two, 2, it says, When pride comes, watch this, that's when shame shows up. But with the humble is wisdom. Many times when we are overwhelmingly nervous, it's because there's pride in our hearts. See, a lot of folks are scared to, to, to do what God has called them to do because they're afraid of messing up. You know, you, you'll never, we'll never accomplish much in life if we are afraid of messing up. You have to be okay with messing up. I, I don't mind being a fool for Christ. I don't mind you laughing at me for Christ. That's why I use almost any kind of illustration I can, as long as it's legal and it's appropriate. I, I, if it's going to help you get the, the, the picture, I use it. I use stories from my past. I don't just use the, the good ones. I'll tell you what I messed up at. Why? Because... Shame shows up when pride is there. I remember when I first started in ministry, I was a 23-year-old kid, and I was, a, I was a, the youngest thing on staff at a 5,000-plus member church in Detroit back then. And, and when I first started, I was Minister Davis. And the and, uh, you know, first time I got up, man, you know, people went, wow, man, that, that young, that young uh, Minister Davis. And, and then the next time I got up, because I didn't get to minister every week, you know, but every couple months or so, I'd get an opportunity. And, and tr- true story, every time I got up, God used me, and I knocked it out the park, man. They would come back talking about how, you know, the, the tape line, it was cassette tapes back then. The line to get cassette tapes was, was wrapped out of the bookstore. And, and sometimes the, the devil can tell you how well you're doing for the purpose of setting you up for a downfall. And they kept telling me just how well I was doing, how many tapes people were buying. It got to the place where I've always had a whole lot of courage and, and, and been willing to just be bold and, and, and not a lot of things that make me overly nervous. But I got to the place where I start being extra nervous every time I found out it was time for me to, to, to minister. I mean, I don't mean just a little. I still get a little nervous right now. Even getting, walking out here to speak to the folks I speak to every week, there's a, there's a little healthy nervousness every single week. But I'm talking about debilitating nervousness. I'm talking about, you know, almost you, you know, can't breathe nervous and start to come over me. And it wasn't there at the beginning. And the Lord had to show me that I had allowed pride to slip up in my heart. I had gotten to the place where I was concerned about messing up in front of these people who I had started doing so well in front of. And he had to go back and remind me, you work for one person. <laughs> Whether you do extremely well or extremely poorly in their eyes, at the end of the day, you go out and do what I've told you to do. Why? Because we serve the Most High God. Give me an amen, somebody. Amen. How about Proverbs thirteen ten? It says, where there is strife, there is what? Pride. I can't hear you. Where there is strife, there is what? Pride. Where there is strife, there is pride, but, w- but wisdom is found in those who take advice. See, strife and pride are like conjoined twins. Like, like conjoined twins. They got one body, two heads, but strife and pride, they always go together. See, when, 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 when strife shows up, you got to fight between two people. There's some pride there because somebody can't say, I'm sorry. Can't look like the fool in somebody else's eyes. Don't want nobody thinking I'm weak. Can't find a compromise that can work for all sides. When pride gets involved, pride starts looking out for what can I get out of this? Come on, man. 
selfishness and pride. We talked about it last week. All these things go hand in hand. And all of this is the environment we live in today. How about Proverbs 29, 23? It says a person's pride is going to bring them down low. But a humble spirit will obtain honor. See, when somebody's operating in pride, listen to me. God, God will try to get your attention. He's got my attention before. Son, that's pride. What do you do when God comes knocking on your, on your door like that? You just humble yourself. You repent for, for allowing pride to creep in. But see, pride will bring you down low. That's why God will come knocking on you. He's knocking on some of your door right now. The reason why you won't let that situation go is pride. You're looking out for your reputation. I don't speak to them. I don't fool with them anymore. Who are you to fool with somebody or not fool with somebody? Who have you become? What sun did you put in place? What moon did you hang? We got to extend forgiveness to people, even if they haven't asked for it. See, a, a, a humble heart is a heart that doesn't stay puffed up. See, pride will bring a person down low. Watch this. Pride will bring a person down because proud people won't listen. There are people who've gone to an early grave. Could have been spared if they just listened to the wisdom God was trying to give them. God gives wisdom from this stage. I say things from this stage I didn't study for. I didn't plan to say it. That's just God's love. Reminds me of the story of Naaman. He's the captain of the Syrian army. Wealthy man, a popular man. He had one big problem. He had leprosy. There was no cure for leprosy back then, and, but they got word that there was a prophet in Israel, Elisha. If you go over there and see him, he can heal you of your, of your leprosy. They sent him to Elisha, and he, he shows up with his great train. That, that means he had his whole entourage with him. I can imagine he's a captain of the Syrian army. He gets dressed up, probably got all, all of his garb, and pulls up in his chariot, and he steps outside, and he's probably waiting on Elisha to be at, there at, the, the, at the end of the curb to greet him, excited to see him. But Elisha doesn't leave his house. He goes up to the front door of Elisha's house, and they knock on the door, and Elisha doesn't even come out. Elisha sends his servant out, and the servant says, the prophet said, go wash in the Jordan River seven times, you'll be clean. The Bible says this, that he went away enraged. Why? He showed up saying he wanted to be healed, but in reality, he just wanted attention. See, God will check our motives, man. <laughs> he's, 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 he's willing to get back in his chariot and go back to Syria with leprosy. Because he's too proud to go dip in the Jordan River. He literally said, aren't there some rivers that are better than that? See, pride will try to tell God how to get the blessing to you. His, his servant said, Master, if, if he, had told us to do, he had told you to do something great, wouldn't you have listened to him then? Why not just go and dip in the Jordan River like he said? He went and dipped seven times in the Jordan River. The last time he came up with his, his skin as smooth as a baby's skin. See, God was trying to fix not only his healing problem or his health problem, he's trying to fix his pride problem too. God is the master of a two-for-one. He's a BOGO God. Come on, somebody. <laughs> he's a BOGO God, man. Last thing, I'll tell you this. When I was in Bible school, I, 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 I was working for General Motors when I started Bible school, so I was making good money, but I had to quit General Motors to go to Bible school. Now I'm working at the local college, Wayne State University, I'm making minimum wage and but I got bills that are based on when I was working for General Motors. I got a car that's based on when I was working for General Motors. And I, I had one of those months where I had more month than money. Anybody know what I'm talking about? There's about eight of you. Anybody know what I'm talking about? My, my, my money ran at like the 20th, but I still had to go to the 31st. Come on. And I get to the f first of the month. I got rent due. I got electric bill due. You know, I got a car bill due. Baby got a dash bill too. <laughs> Work it out. I mean, I got all these bills that are due first of the month. And if you've ever been in that position, the closer you get to that deadline, the pressure starts to build. And I'm starting to try to call people to see if, you know what, that's what we do. Instead of really trusting God, we start trying to work it out on our own. I'm calling everybody to see if I can borrow money. Nobody can help me out. And I get down to literally the last couple of days, and it's a Friday night, and I'm coming from work, and our church was having an all-night prayer. We used to have prayer from 9 p.m. to 6 a.m. the next morning. And my, my head was like, no, you need to be here calling some people. But then the other side, I was like, you done called everybody. You might as well go to church. So I go to church, and I, and I walk in. I don't walk in looking sad so somebody can ask me what's wrong. I 
<laughs> I walk in normal, man. I go sit in my section and praising God. And it was about 2 o'clock in the morning, man. Our pastor says, there's, there's some people out here that are in financial trouble. I said, I don't mean just you can use money. Everybody can use a little more money. There's some people in financial trouble. Said, if that's you, stand up. Pride almost told me to stay seated because I'm a Bible school student. And my mind is telling me, you know, you're in Bible school. You shouldn't have financial trouble. But I went ahead and stood up. I'm, I'm going to get some prayer. Then he said, all of you that are standing up, step out to the aisle and come down here to the front. I'm like, oh. True story. If I had known he was going to make us come down there, I probably wouldn't have stood up. Though I have a need. Come down there to the front. And I'm thinking he's about to pray for us. And he says, all right, I want you all to turn around and face the audience. I'm like, he's going to pray for us from the back? That's different. <laughs> turn around and face the audience. True story. He gives us some instructions. And then he tells the ushers, I want you to put an offering bucket in every one of their hands. Now I'm standing at the front of this church. 2,000 plus people out here. 2 o'clock in the morning. Looking like an orphan from the <laughs> Feed a Hungry Child commercial. I'm standing there like this with a bucket in my hand, and I am so embarrassed because I hear I am a Bible school student, and I got a bucket in my hand because I am broke, can't pay my bills. Same time, I have a need, but my pride is wanting to, t- I want a, a private check in the mail. Come on, talk to me, somebody. I want the IRS to have made a mistake on my taxes. I want somebody to walk up and give me one of them holy handshakes. You know how to do that? And you just kind of walk. You, you want to look right away, but you, can, you got to keep it to yourself for a minute. But instead, I'm standing up here in the front with a bucket. Then he says, I want you all to be led. And just go to whoever you led and go fill their buckets. And he told the musicians, play some, some shouting music. And so everybody dancing and, and, you know, everybody coming and shouting. And they're coming, you know, everybody jumping up and they're coming and shouting, putting money in the bucket. And you know how people are like, it's going to be all right, baby. What I heard were, you poor little broke thing, don't worry about it. <laughs> That's not what they said. That's what I heard. Pride filtered it. You little broke Bible student. That's okay. And I'm standing there, man, everybody dancing, and I'm like, oh, my goodness. I feel so horrible. Then I look down at that bucket. I saw that money starting to pile up. All of a sudden, I didn't feel so... Hey! (laughs) I walked out of there. I had, listen, I had the exact amount of money I needed to pay every bill that I had, plus the tithe on top of it. Come on, don't you tell me God is not good. Come on, don't you tell me God is not good. But God was doing a BOGO. He was trying to meet my need, but also bust my pride bubble. Because I'm sitting out here broke as can be, but with pride. And God needed me to understand, I can fix your money problem, but you'll be right back in that same money problem if you don't let me fix your pride problem. There's some people out here right now, you've gotten caught in the current. I know you have. The current is taking you to a pride place, and God is trying to get you out of that spot. But you've got to be willing to throw your hands in the air. Surrender to him. Amen. Humble yourself under the mighty hand of God. Let him exalt you when he's ready to exalt you. But just know God can lift you up way better than trying to lift yourself up. Give God a shout and a praise in this place. All right, every head bow, please. All eyes close in prayer. If you're here today and you do not know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, I want to pray for you. Not calling you a bad person. You can be one of the nicest people in the room and still not be saved. That's because salvation is not something that we earn from God by just being good. Salvation is a free gift that God offers to mankind. But like any other gift, one person can offer it. The person on the other side has got to receive it. And right here in this moment, God is knocking on the door of your heart. And he's offering you salvation. He's offering you the blood of Jesus to pay the price for your sin. He's offering you relationship with him. He's offering you to step in and change your whole world from the inside out. But he's offering of it, but you got to receive it. So in this moment right here, I'm asking you, ma'am or sir, teenager, if you're not born again, if you don't know for certain that you would walk out here today and go to heaven if you breathe your last breath, will you please let me pray for you? I'm not going to embarrass you. I'm not going to ask you to come to the front of the church right there where you're seated or right there online. 
I want to lead you in a really simple prayer that will change your life forever. But I need you to give me permission to include you in on this prayer. So I'm going to count to three. And when I get to three, if you say, yes, pastor, include me in on this prayer. When I get to three, I'm just going to ask you to just lift up your hand right there at your seat. Nothing more than that. Lift up your hand. Let me acknowledge you that you're saying yes. And when, after I do so, I'm going to lead you in a prayer. And this prayer is going to change your life from the inside out. So here we go. When I get to three, if you're saying yes to, to Christ, I'm going to ask you to be bold enough to raise your hand. Here we go. One, two, three. Lift up your hand if that's you. Thank you. Thank you. Beautiful. See that hand there. Thank you, sir. Another hand there. Thank you. Another hand right there. Thank you. I see that hand there. Thank you. Another hand there in the back. Come on. Anyone else? By raising your hand, you're simply saying, yes, I want to surrender my life to Christ today. God's not concerned about how messed up you think you are, how many mistakes you think you made. Have enough humility to recognize, I I need Jesus. I need a Savior. Anybody else before we pray? All right, every one of you that raised your hand for prayer, I want you to whisper this prayer right there at your seat. Say, dear God in heaven, I thank you for sending your son Jesus to die in my place. You raised him from the dead, and I know he's alive right now. So Jesus, come into my heart now. Save me. Forgive me. Make me brand new. I surrender my life to you for the rest of my days. <clears throat> and according to the Bible, I am right now born again. Amen. Come on, put your hands together. Impact.